few that have reached out and wished me a happy birthday. I got up, I told Ron, I got up yesterday morning and took a good look at myself in the mirror and said, nothing looks different. So, <laughs> so I'm okay. As we're to the end of the year, there's a couple of things I wanted to talk to you about this morning as we get ready to turn that page. And, and listen, there is nothing magical about midnight, December 31st, and then into January the 1st of 2020. It's just another tick on the clock, but there's something about a new beginning, an opportunity to start over and to re kind of refresh things uh, to maybe do better than we did before. I want to talk to you this morning about our mission. And uh, we have a mission at uh, Ridgeline Church. And it is a common mission that every church that calls itself under the umbrella of, of the Christian faith, that same mission is to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And to win others to Christ. To make disciples. Now, I want to give you six simple tenets that, sh that are the foundation of who we are. All right, these are six things that uh, really define our purpose. And yes, they define our mission. They are a big part of our mission. And they really dictate as to why we even exist as a local church. The first one is this. We, well, they, they gave me all of them. I thought it was going to give them to me one at a time, but here they are. The first one is we're here to worship the Lord. We are here to elevate the name of Christ above all others. That is our sole purpose. We were created for the purpose of glorifying God. Amen. And so we're here to worship Him. The second thing we're here to do is to disciple believers. That means we are to win people to Christ and then teach them. And grow them in their faith. If we do a great disservice to people if we share the gospel with them and pique their interest and then never follow up with them. If we just give them a little taste of it and then let them just kind of squalor through life on their own, they don't grow. It's like bringing a baby home from the hospital. You don't just put that kid in the middle of the floor and say, Welcome to the family. Good luck. No, we nurture, we, we tend to, we feed that child so that it will begin to grow and develop into the child it ought to be. The same thing is so true with believers. We need to disciple them. Disciple means to, to learn, to teach. And we have to teach them. The third thing is we need to celebrate unity. We don't do this very well. And when I say celebrate unity, it's got to start here within this body. But we've also got to celebrate a united front with others whose flavor may be a little bit different from ours. You with me? We've got, we've got to realize that the folks down the street are on the same side as us. They've got a same overall purpose, and that is to preach the gospel. So we've got, to, we've got to stop cutting the legs out from under each other and start standing together and celebrating the, the united front that we have and the unity that we have as the body of Christ. The next thing we are called to do is reach the lost. We do not do a good job with this. And I'm not talking about just us. I'm talking about the Christian church as a whole right now. We are not doing a very good job in reaching lost people. You know how I know that's true? Because the lost population is getting bigger. And the Christian population, the church family, is shrinking. The next thing is we need to equip for ministry. That's where our giftedness comes into play. And when we get into the new year, 
Well, one of the things we're going to talk about, I'm going to be preaching about, is how we recognize the, we are, how we are gifted by the Holy Spirit and how we're supposed to take those gifts and put them into practice. A couple of years ago, I, did, I preached a series on the fruit of the Spirit. That's not the same thing. The gifts of the Spirit are something totally different. And the last thing we're called to do is live out the love of Christ. It can't be just Sunday morning. It's got to be the way you live every moment of your life, wherever you are, wherever you go. When Paul said, we are ambassadors, an ambassador represents another country everywhere he goes. Not just when he's sitting in the office or when he is um, uh, in front of a crowd. It's everywhere he goes at every moment of his life. He is representing another government. And we are ambassadors of another country. And we are called to represent Christ in everything we do. You know what? I look at these things. If we could do these things, if we would do these things, the results are unlimited. That's what God would do. Now, let me say something about church and how too many people perceive it. You'd be surprised to learn that the number of people today who still believe that church is strictly a building. It's a physical brick and mortar structure. That's their idea of church. You know, it's amazing. If this thing right here burned to the ground... It wouldn't impact the church at all because the church is not blocks and brick. Now, the word church comes from a Greek term, ecclesia, or ecclesia. I don't know how to pronounce that. I've heard it so many different ways. But it, 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 it's a word that nobody can say, but it means an assembly. And the use of this term tells us that the true meaning of church is is not a building it's people and today here's how I know people misunderstand that because you ask people out on the street do you go to church and if they say yes ask them where they go to church they'll tell you well I'm a Baptist or I'm Methodist or I'm Church of God or I'm Church of Christ or I'm a nun, whatever. And what they are referring to is they're referring to a denomination or they're referring to a building. They're, they're not talking about an assembly of believers. So church is not a denomination. Church is not a physical structure. The truth is church is the body of believers. In fact, Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 details for us the purpose of the church. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now that is a great description of the church in her beginning. The church is the place where biblical doctrine is taught so that every believer can become grounded in their faith. Ephesians 4 and 14, Paul says, Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. You see, church is to be a source where believers can come together and enjoy each other's company. Church is a place of fellowship. Church is a place where we can come and be devoted to one another. It's a place where we come to honor one another, to instruct one another, to be kind and compassionate to one another. It's where we come to encourage one another and love one another. It's a place for teaching. Fellowship. It's also a place of prayer. Amen. You know, the church believes in prayer because we believe prayer is what connects us with God. That's right. That's right. And that's why we do this on Thursday nights. I'm going to put in my commercial here. This is why we gather to pray on Thursday nights. We are striving to connect with our Creator. We are striving to, to stay in contact, in intimate connection with Him. And that's why every week I implore you to come and join us. 
if you if you are not comfortable praying out loud, I don't care. You don't have to. Half of the people that come never voice a word verbally, but they are joining us as we pray. So church and prayer can't be separated. Now in Act or excuse me, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul tells us that the church is Christ's body here in the world. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along with me. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I'm going to start reading with verse 12. A great description of who we are. Read along with me if you have your Bible. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one. If a foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if the whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where He wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members, so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all of the parts suffer are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. He's the head. We are the hands, the mouth, and the feet of Jesus in the world, and we are supposed to do the things that Jesus would be doing if he were physically walking on the earth, because we are the body of Christ. So with all of that in mind this morning, I want to talk to you about the three types of churches that are, that are evident in the world today. And I'm going to be using some terminology you're going, you're going to recognize because it's, things, it's, it's terminology that I've used in the past. But I want you to understand the reason I'm bringing these things to you today as we're wrapping up this year is the last thing I want to be is a run-of-the-mill church. I mean, I, I want to be a place where people know that this is a place where I could go and I can encounter the Spirit of God. Because it's a place where He is active and He's at work. And I want, to be able to, I want to be able to look back at this day and this time 10 years from now and say, you know, we made a difference then. We, we, were, we did something that made a difference. So let's talk about the three churches that are in the world today. Here's the first one. It's called the Maintenance Church. Now, over the years, maintenance churches have been referred to in a lot of different ways. People call them the conventional church. Uh, some people call them the country club church. Uh, but anyway, it, it's usually a circle where you can look at the church and you can realize that they have kind of made themselves their purpose. Uh, now, the reason they're referred to as, as a maintenance church is because their foremost priority 
is to maintain all the programs and all of the practices that they have established in the years past. And here's the mindset. If it worked 15 years ago, it ought to work now. Let me give you an extreme example of that. There are still churches today trying to run bus ministries. You remember that? Back in the early 70s, you know, if, if, if you loved your church, you had a bus. And if you loved Jesus, you had two. Remember? You, you had to have two so that they could compete against each other. And they would run those bus ministries and they'd bring kids in. Um, but it's interesting. When the Arab oil embargo hit in the late 70s, all of a sudden the bus ministry wasn't the way to go because nobody could afford it. And so the bus ministry kind of died and it kind of faded away. And beside that, nowadays, when you look at, look, back then, the, I think they, the average number of automobiles in, in a driveway at, at the every, average home was 1.75. I don't know how you have three quarters of a car. But the average was one and three quarter cars per household. Now it's four. So our, our society has become much more mobile and so the idea of needing a bus to transport somebody to school, that idea has really kind of faded into the, into the background. But you've got a lot of churches that are still trying to maintain that old program because it worked. It worked 50 years ago. Am I, are you all getting mad at me? Because uh, you're looking at me like you're not sure where we're going with this. There's another characteristic about maintenance churches, and that is they're committed to the building. The church must look good all the time to outsiders. And the maintenance churches can be described as a church that is spiritually, now, now y'all love me, but it is spiritually self-absorbed. Uh, there's All the focus is on history, all the focus is on tradition, and they kind of miss the mission for which they were created to do. It's kind of like having a fortress mentality. You know what that is. You pull up the drawbridge, you dig a moat, and you dare anybody to try to get to you. It, it's, it's really a church that's in denial. And it's important to realize that this kind of thinking only serves to insulate you against the world. And instead of seeing the world as a mission field, the world becomes our enemy. And we treat them as such. And by the way, unless you're wondering, this is not something new. When Jesus first appeared and was, was teaching and preaching among mankind, do you know who he encountered? He encountered a Judaism that was dominated by a group called the Pharisees. And they were a sect that had perfected this idea of a mindset religion. I mean, you, you talk about a fortress. They, they built walls everywhere they went. And their heritage could be traced back to a spiritual movement that emerged following the exile. And over the years, their driving philosophy became, how can we preserve and pass down the Jewish faith and our values in this pagan surrounding? Now mind you, it started out good. Their, their cause started out as a response to the call for personal righteousness. But it took a wrong turn somewhere. And by the time Christ came along, this spiritual renewal movement that birthed Phariseeism had developed into a rigid sectarian religious party. And the Pharisees had constructed this subculture that insulated them from the contamination of the unclean world. And by the way, that unclean world included most of their Jewish neighbors. So they were consumed with his idea of ritual cleansing. When they traveled from town to town, they wouldn't stay with anybody except another Pharisee. Their social life revolved around other members of the sect. And they practiced a come and get it evangelism strategy that basically said... 
If you want what we have, then you're going to have to come to us to get it. And when you do come, we're going to make you jump through so many hoops, you're going to give up. They observed the law. They kept the Sabbath. They let everybody know this is how you keep the faith. And at the same time, ordinary common Jews who were dubbed by them as sinners, they felt this pressure of not being able to meet God's demands as determined and dictated by these religious experts. And so the disdain and the aloof behavior of the Pharisees toward those who were outside of their circle earned them the reputation of being judgmental, self-righteous, and hypocritical. Now, let's talk about the contemporary North American church. Evangelism today has been reduced in large to a hostile environment towards the unchurched today. Let's be honest. We look at the world and we see them as the enemy. Christians tend to cluster with other Christians. And in those clusters, and, 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 and listen, I'm in the middle of the cluster, okay? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, tr trying to set myself. I'm as guilty as they come. But we cluster, and in our clusters, we, we look with judgmental eyes at the people outside of our circle. And our approach to them is to say, if we have something you need, you're going to have to come to us to get it. And there's a determination that is often made by a local church, sometimes even by denominations, that says, there is a way that is acceptable unto man, and that way is our way. So you're either going to have to conform to what we determine to be acceptable, and if you do, that conforming will be the testimony of your faith. And at the same time, those who are outside of the circle, the unchurched, they feel the pressure of not being able to meet God's demands as the church sees them. And the disdain and the aloof behavior of many Christians toward those outside of the church earns them the reputation of being judgmental, self-righteous, and hypocritical. Now, not every maintenance church is this way. But for the most part, that's how the outside world perceives them. I mean, you listen to people. I don't go to church because it's just full of hypocrites. You ever heard that? Well, you know, there's a great answer to that. Well, you can go to church with the hypocrites, or you can go to hell with them. <laughs> it's your choice. But to try to put it in a nutshell, maintenance churches tend to do everything for themselves. Okay? And, and from my heart I say, this is not the kind of church we want to be. Okay? Alright, there's another kind of church, and you're familiar with this term, a seeker church. This is something that has just kind of come about in the last... Uh, 40 to 50 years or so. And, and let me share some statistics with you about this movement. Barna Research, uh, which is an organization that tracks and uh, records church trends and practices, uh, came up with these statistics. And these are, these are about seven or eight years old. So I don't know what the actual numbers are now. But they, they estimate the number of unchurched people in the United States to be between 75 and 80 million adults in the United States right now are currently unchurched. Now when you add to that number teenagers and children that belong to those adults, that number can balloon up to close to 200 million people without a lot of trouble. Add to that the estimated 15 to 20 million adults and children who claim to be born again but are no longer attending church anywhere, 
and you get an enormous number. I mean, picture it this way. If the unchurched population in the United States could all be gathered together, and if they were to become a nation of their own, they would be the 11th most populated nation on the planet. I mean, when you think about those kind of numbers, what we've seen in the last 50 years is this, the advent of this movement that's called the Seeker Church. And Seeker Churches were intentionally designed, I mean, everything about their operation, everything, all of their programming, all of their services, everything, their goal is to attract people who have no church background whatsoever. That means they will steer away from things that, the kind of things that most churches would identify with, and they strive to present a generic, a non-threatening atmosphere. I mean, in, in extreme cases, they have no religious symbols of any kind. They would not have a cross at the front of their building because they would not want to do anything that might offend someone or make them uncomfortable. They don't want to be threatening. The pattern that they set up. They build an environment that is built on comfort. Theater style seating, uh, high impact stage lights, uh, music that is uh, including multiple instruments, it's high energy and multiple genres. Uh, they use drama and they use comedy to try to set up a message and the sermon is never called a sermon. It's a talk or a challenge. And what makes a seeker church stand out, especially to its target group, is how they focus their, their efforts and their attention on congregational sensitivity. They do this by these innovative programs and by addressing current issues. Uh, an example, Rick Warren's uh, Saddleback Church. Uh, Bill Hybels, uh, Willow Creek. Well, really, that's kind of the, the, the birthplace of the whole movement is the Willow Creek Church. And uh, let, let, me tell you some, let me tell you a little bit about them. On an average Sunday, they will attract over 15,000 people to multiple services. And when you ask them the secret of their growth, they'll tell you, we're intentionally targeting white-collar people between the ages of 25 and 45, people who aren't attending church. And their strategy is to hold about a 45-minute service just something just long enough to keep them from getting bored because they want those who do not belong to church, who don't profess to be Christians, to understand it can be done. And it won't take a lot of time. Now, it's easy to, to get into a church like this because it's all anonymous. They don't take your name. They don't seat you. They don't require anything of you. You don't even have to sing the songs if you don't want to. Uh, they'll give you a bulletin that, that will tell you all the things that are going on. And it's basically an approach that is low profile, low expectation. And like I said, it's designed for people who are not familiar with church. And the philosophy has shown some success. I mean, you, you, can't, you, you can't argue with their numbers. However, Bill Hybels himself said that after 40 years of this effort, they decided to start following up on some of the people who had come through the Willow Creek Church to see where they were, and they had found that discipleship was almost null and void. The people weren't growing. They had not grown. So the idea of getting them in and getting them to profess, but then not helping them grow was a great failure on his part. And that has really been kind of the case of the seeker church across the board. The idea has been more just to get them introduced to the idea. Well, then there's one more. And, and by the way, I don't want to be this kind of church either. All right. And then there's the church on mission. When you talk about a, a church with a mission philosophy you're, you're going to take aspects of the other two and, and glean from some of that and put those together but you're going to move away from the idea that the church is a, is a club for Christians and you're going to move more towards that perspective that the church is Christ's body and we have been sent to reconcile the world to God himself and missions 
is not something we do overseas. Missions is not an activity. Missions becomes our sole purpose. And by the way, there is a mission field right here. Our mission field is East Ridge and Rossville and Fort Oglethorpe and Catoosa County and Walker County and Hamilton County and Chattanooga. We are, we are placed right in the middle of a fertile mission field. And our purpose is to get out there with a plow and start plowing, start planting. Let me sum it up this way. We're a body of believers who see the church as the people of God who have been sent on a mission. That's the mindset of a church on mission. Man, I'm taking a long time, but I'm not going to quit. I'm going to give you nine very specific markers that, that really identify what a church on mission is. All right? I'm, I, yeah, I'm not going to rush this. If you've got somewhere to go, Bye. Um, but I'm going to keep doing I'm going to stay, all right? Here. Here's the first. The first marker is churches on a mission have a high threshold for membership. That means we have, a, we have expectations of members. Boy, now people don't like this part, but y'all love me, okay? You know, the first time I read this, I thought, this is so opposite of the thinking of most churches today. There, let's be honest. In most churches today, there's very little accountability. There's very little requirement placed on church people. And we have, unfortunately, been willing to accept whoever, whatever, in order just to keep the peace and to keep people coming. But now, if discipleship is the core... Making disciples, being a disciple. Well, I remember Jesus saying something about having to bear a cross in all of this. It takes work. It takes commitment. It takes accountability. It requires high expectations. And church, churches on mission let believers know you are accountable. You are responsible. We have expectations of you. Here's the second marker. Churches on a mission are not religious. Thank you. They are real. They're authentic. They are transparent. And they work hard. Now, 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 get this. They work hard at keeping one foot in the world. Jesus said, you are in the world, but you're not of it. But you've got to stay connected to it if you're going to influence it. That's it. We can't just... Here's a, you know what they've shown that one year from the time that a person becomes a Christian, within one year they have no non-Christian friends because we cluster and we find strength and encouragement from each other and we pull away from those who need us the most. That's religion. Being real is keeping one foot in the world. Here's the third marker. Churches on a mission teach Christians to obey the Word. You've got to teach the Christian faith as something that is practical and not surreal. And, you know, if, if we're not careful, I love the way, I think it, was, it might have been Brother Bill Neese, he said, sometimes you've got some people that are so heavenly minded they're of no earthly good. You know. We don't want to do that. We want to teach them to be real. The fourth marker is that churches on mission believe that worship is creative and participatory. It's not just three hymns and offering and a prayer. Worship is an intentional act. It is pointing your attention towards God. I've told Linda, I, I want to stop calling what they do the worship team team sounds like we're at a ball game and, and, and they're playing the game and we're the spectators. No, I, wanna, I told her I want to use the term we are, we, are, we are here to usher you into the presence of God. Amen. That means we're here. We're not leading you. We're going with you. Amen. And our purpose is not for you to watch us. It's not to listen to us. It's to focus on the audience of one who deserves our praise and our worship. Amen. Come on, preach, brother. 
I've lost my place. It's okay. Let's move to the fifth one. Missional went too far. Went too far. Mission, churches on mission live apostolically. That means they understand every member is a missionary. Every member is called to go out into the mission field. And that, beloved, that means that your world and my world is right here. There's the field we are called to. And it teaches, mission, churches on mission teach their people to impact their immediate world. Here's the sixth one. Churches on mission do not want to change the world. They expect to change the world. They aggressively work to transform communities. I see, I think back to our Wednesday night uh, outreach that we've done the last two summers. I see that, I see that this is an action. We're doing this with the expectation we're going to reach our neighborhood one way or the other. We're going to get the word out. That's right. Amen. And I'm assuming, elders, we're going to do that again this year. Amen. Here's number seven. Churches on mission act with a purpose. They take their resources and they put them towards mission. And this is painful, but now, here again, y'all love me. The best way to determine if we are doing this is to evaluate the church budget. Where are we spending our money? And I heard Charles Shoemate one time make the statement, if you're spending more money on cleaning supplies than you are on evangelism, you got it wrong. Amen. Number eight. Churches on mission measure growth by their capacity to release rather than retain. The church on a mission, one of its goals must be birth. Mothering a new church somewhere. Does that scare you to think about? The idea of us helping another congregation start? I'll never forget, I heard Steve Childs at Anderson camp meeting years ago talking about how the church he was pastoring in Phoenix was helping to plant two new churches at the same time. And somebody came to him and said, Brother Steve, are you telling me you are willing to give up some of your own people to help start another church? And I loved his answer. He said, Brother, if I can hand pick them, I'll help them pack. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But we need to realize we are not here just to, to build something here. It's to grow, to expand, to multiply. And here's the last one. Churches on mission place kingdom concerns first. That means we are more focused on building the kingdom of God than we are on building a movement, on a denomination, or even a local congregation. So, okay, Pastor, why are you telling us all this today? Because like a majority of the churches that are meeting across the country today, we don't fit the description of a church on mission. Not yet. But here's the good news. We can do more than just turn the page of the calendar this year and start a new year. We can become a whole new church. Amen. Come on. We can become a whole new movement Amen. in East Ridge. Amen. But it's going to take more than just agreeing. Right. It's going to take work. It's going to take effort. It's going to take... Oh, you're going to love this part. It's going to take money. Because unfortunately, we are not accomplishing much ministry 
because we don't have the money. I really want to see that change. And let me put it to you this way. If we go down, I want to go down fighting. Amen. And let me remind you of something uh, in Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, not my favorite piece of literature, but the first four words in chapter one are the most valuable four words in the whole book. And it's a great reminder for all of us. It's not about you. you know, let, let me say it to you this way. If you are a Christian, if you are born again, if you know Christ as Savior, You've got yours. You've got your promise. You, you've got your hope. You're saved. Your purpose now is to make a way for as many others as possible to be saved. That is our mission. And that's why you found this in your bulletin this morning. When was the last time... You sequestered yourself in a prayer closet somewhere and you began to pray for lost people. Let's turn the page. Let's take a whole new focus to this coming year. Let's begin to pray for lost people with a vengeance. With a passion that we have never known before. And you say, well, I don't know if I can do that. Then ask God to give it to you. It was William Booth, who was the, the founder of the Salvation Army, who said the greatest training people could ever find that would encourage them to pray for lost people, he said, I wish they could be suspended above hell for 24 hours. And he said they would never stop praying for the lost. I gave it to you in, a, in this form because I want you to keep it. This is a bookmark, by the way. This is a refrigerator picture. This is something that I want you to put the names down of the people you are burdened for. And I want you to put this in a problem. I want you to see this every day. I want this to be a reminder that if we are going to change, if we're going to change our community, if we're going to impact this, this place here, it's going to take work. It's going to take blood and sweat and a lot of prayer. And it starts with praying for the lost. Do you even, do you know any lost people? Then put their name on here. You say, well, I don't hardly, I don't really know them. Do you know they're lost? Then they need to be saved. And whether they are saved here or if they're saved at a church down the street, you know what I call that? I call that a win. Amen. Because it's kingdom work we're talking about. I'm just going to quit with that. No, we're not going to sing. Because I think I've given you enough to realize that the only person that can change you is you. And the only person that can do what you need to do is you. I hope y'all know I love y'all. If I didn't love you, I, would, I, I, I don't think I'd have the courage to say what I've been saying this morning. But I want to see us reaching people who need Jesus. It starts with us praying and asking God to prepare the field, to plant the seed, so that we could be a part of the harvest. Are you with me, Linda? All right. Well, let's pray, and I'm just going to let you go home. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you saved us one day, and we came to know you as a Savior. 
and as a Lord and a companion unlike any other. And you saved us, Lord, so that we could begin a journey. And that journey includes being on mission. So help us. Grow us, we pray. We want to be genuine disciples of, of Jesus Christ. And in that discipling, we want to begin to disciple others. And that starts by praying for them, winning them, and helping them grow. God, we lay claim. We lay claim to the land around us. In the Old Testament, many times, the, the leaders of Israel would, would pray and they would claim a territory. And God, as we're about to turn the page into a new year, we claim this part of, of, our, of, our, of our mission. We claim this part of East Ridge. We claim this part of Rossville across the street. We claim portions of Chattanooga. We claim portions of Ringo. Lord, we, we claim the territory that you have marked out for us. And I pray that we'll have the courage to acquire it for your glory. Give us a burden for the names of those we need to pray for. And Lord, may we celebrate one by one as they've come to Christ. Go with us from, the, from this place. Restore us, O oh Lord, to be a church on mission. As we pray in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Now get out there. <laughs>